Hello and welcome to lecture 48 of this series of lectures on fluids and electrolytes. This series is based on my book, Manual of Fluid, Electrolyte, and Acid-Based Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I'm Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I'm a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. This is the book. You can find it on Amazon. Please follow the link below. It's available as an ebook and hardcover. Both are in full color, and also there is a paperback edition. We are still on Chapter 7, Hypophosphatemia and Hyperphosphatemia. This is Part 2 of Phosphate Homeostasis. As we mentioned before, renin handling of phosphate involves three hormonal systems. The parathyroid hormone, we discussed that in the previous lecture. Today we are going to discuss calcitriol and FGF23. Now let's look at this. Uh, this is very well known to everyone, the feedback mechanism. So whenever a hormone increases the production of another hormone, that other hormone will have to suppress the original one. So if TSH, the thyrosimulating hormone, increases the production of T4, T4 will have to suppress the production of TSH. Otherwise, this positive feed feedback loop will never end, will go out of control. So let's look at these three components of phosphate homeostasis. We have the PTH, we have the 125-dihydroxy vitamin D, and then we have the FGF23 or the fibroblast growth factor 23. So as you can see, PTH is going to stimulate FGF23 and 125-dihydroxy D. But on the other hand, both FGF23 and 125D are going to suppress PTH. Also, PTH and 125-dihydroxy D are going to stimulate the release of FGF23, but FGF23 is going to suppress PTH and 125D. Finally, PTH is going to stimulate 125D, while 125D in return is going to suppress PTH. So if a hormone stimulates the production of another one, the response will be that the product is going to suppress the original hormone. Okay, That's the same thing with any endocrinological system. Now, if you want to remember it easier, PTH is going to stimulate both FGF23 and 125D, while FGF23 is going to suppress both PTH and 25D. Now, all is left is for you to remember that PTH increases the production of 125-dihydroxy D in the kidneys because it stimulates the 1-alpha-hydroxylase, and then in return, 125D will have to suppress uh, PTH. Uh, so uh, that's all about this very important slide. Now, calcitriol 125-dihydroxy D increases both the intestinal and renal absorption of phosphate and calcium, not just in the kidneys, in the kidneys and the intestines. Now, calcitriol inhibits PTH production, while, like we just said, PTH stimulates calcitriol production. How? It inhibits PTH production by suppressing the parathyroid glands but it stimulates FGF23 production by the bones, and uh, we just mentioned that in the previous slide. Now let's talk for a minute about fibroblast growth factor 23 slash clotho. FGF23 is produced in the bone. By what? By osteocytes and osteoblasts. Now, when serum phosphate level starts to increase early on in the course of chronic kidney disease, FGF23 level starts to increase, and that is going to lead to phosphaturia, so more excretion of phosphate in the urine and the return of phosphate towards normal, at least in those early stages. Now, how does it do that? FGF23 23 is going to decrease phosphate reabsorption in the proximal tubule and the small intestine. So we have a renal effect and we have an intestinal effect. Now for FGF23 to work, it needs a cofactor. In order for it to bind to FGF receptor 1, it needs clotho. So this is why you're always going to see FGF23 slash clotho. Okay, so they walk together, they're best friends. Now, if you're going to remember one thing from this lecture, and maybe the next lecture, it should be this slide. 
This summarizes really everything. Now, this is what happens with these hormonal systems when the GFR declines. As you can see in the red, marked as number one, as the GFR starts to decline, the glomerular filtration rate starts to go down. We're still early, stage two chronic kidney disease, FGF23 starts to rise. Maybe phosphate starts to increase. FGF23 is going to increase phosphate excretion in the urine, so phosphate remains normal. You don't even notice that on a blood test. It's going to be normal at the expense of increased FGF23 production. Now, this is followed by number two. Number two is what? We are going to see a decline in 125-dihydroxyvitamin D production because it is made in the kidneys. And if you have chronic kidney disease, then 125-dihydroxy D level is going to decline. Now, when it declines, you are going also to have a decrease in the renal and intestinal absorption of phosphate. So it serves our purpose of decreasing phosphate. Now, number three, phosphate is still up. Now we are going to have an increase in parathyroid hormone level. The mechanism, I discussed that in detail in the previous lecture. Now, finally, phosphate starts to rise as you reach stage four chronic kidney disease. So all these mechanisms, the increase in PTH, which leads to excretion of phosphate in the urine, the increase in FGF23, which also will lead to increase in phosphate excretion in the urine and decreased absorption in the small intestine. The 125-dihydroxy-D decrease, which will lead to a decrease in the absorption of phosphate in the intestine and also the kidneys. All that will not be enough anymore, and phosphate starts to rise. So these mechanisms start to be activated in stage two or three, but you don't start to see hyperphosphatemia until you get to stage four or five. This is a very important slide. Okay, take a mental picture of it. Keep it with you. Okay, let's continue to discuss FGF23 and Clotho. So FGF23 and PTH are both phosphaturic. You, you can notice here that I'm repeating the same point again and again. I really want to make an impression on you. You really have to understand that. It's not easy, but repetition is key. So FGF23 and PTH are both phosphaturic, but they have an opposite effect on calcitriol. Yeah, in other words, they have opposite effect on 1-alpha-hydroxy, well, 1-alpha-hydroxylase, uh, which is the enzyme that converts 25-hydroxy-D to 125-D, which is calcitriol. So FGF23 is going to suppress the production of calcitriol, while PTH is going to increase it. Now, like we said, FGF23 is going to suppress the synthesis of PTH in the, in the parathyroid gland, and also suppress the production of calcitriol. Like we said, FGF23 is a downer, is going to suppress both PTH and also calcitriol, okay? It doesn't like anyone. FGF23 level increases early in the course of CKD, like I showed on the previous slide, maybe around stage two. And this increase is associated with an increase in all-cause mortality, incident heart failure, and cardiovascular events. So these are association studies, but we are th starting to gather more data. Okay, another summary slide. I'm, again, making the same points here. Osteocytes, osteoblasts, this is where FGF23 originates. It's going to have an effect on renal tubular cells. Incidentally, if you have low iron, it's going to increase the level of FGF23. Okay, so let's take the first scenario. If phosphate level is up, it's going to increase the level of FGF23. When it is increased, is going to increase the excretion of phosphate in the urine and decrease the level of 125-dihydroxy vitamin D production in the kidneys. On the other hand, when phosphate level is low, you are going to have a decrease in the re release of FGF23 from the bones, and this is going to decrease phosphate excretion by the kidneys and is going to increase production of 125-dihydroxy D in the kidneys as well. Now, what about the role of acid-base balance in phosphate? Okay. Now, we said that phosphate, we have two kinds of phosphate, okay, monohydrate and dihydrate. And the ratio of monohydrate to 
dihydrate is 4 to 1. And this is a very important buffer system, okay? It mitigates acid-base disorder. So this is called also titratable acidity, and we are going to discuss that in detail in uh, future lectures when we talk about metabolic acidosis. Now, metabolic acidosis causes phosphaturia, and this leads to acid removal because these are buffer systems, while metabolic alkalosis stimulates phosphate reabsorption in the kidneys. So they have contrasting effects. Now, let's uh, compare the actions of PTH and FGF23, okay, as a final summary slide here. PTH is produced by the parathyroid glands, while FGF23 is produced by the bones, osteocytes and osteoblasts. What's the main action of PTH? PTH regulates calcium and phosphorus, while FGF23 mainly regulates phosphorus. What's the main stimulus of PTH production? Low calcium. If you have low calcium, you are going to have high PTH. If you have high calcium, you are going to suppress PTH, unless you have primary hyperparathyroidism. Now, FGF23 is stimulated by hyperphosphatemia, like I mentioned several times now. Now, the renal effect of PTH is phosphaturia, and this is the same for FGF23. Both are phosphaturic. What about the effect on calcitriol synthesis? PTH is going to increase the renal production of calcitriol, while FGF23 is going to decrease calcitriol synthesis. Okay, now I understand that I gave you a lot of information in this lecture. I strongly recommend that you uh, watch it again, maybe two, three times. Uh, this is very interesting, very exciting. Few people have a good grasp on these concepts. And then in the next lecture, we are going to uh, finalize our discussion of phosphate homeostasis. I'm going to review some aspects. And after that, we will uh, start our discussion of hypophosphatemia and then hyperphosphatemia. See you then.